Hey guys, Brenda New Productions here, and welcome to this Python tutorial on function decorators. In this tutorial, I'm going to be discussing, well, function decorators, which are very useful ways to alter a function and add functionality to it uh, at the function's definition time. So, in this tutorial, I'm going to be using uh, my text editor to actually demonstrate this instead of the Python REPL, since this will show us the power of the reusability of function decorators. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start with a very simple example of a function decorator that adds debug messages to a function call, and then a slightly more uh, sophisticated example of a function decorator that times function calls. So let's go ahead and get started. First, I kind of want to motivate why function decorators exist. So let's go ahead and create a function. I'm going to call it foo. And all foo does is print hello. And then when we call foo, this isn't anything out of the ordinary. When we call foo, we get the function, or we get the print message, hello. And then similarly, if we actually take foo here and we give it an argument, and then we change our print message accordingly, this is pretty basic stuff. And then we call foo with an argument we now print out the proper print message. Then we can also change the function to return a message. And then we won't actually see the message until we call print on it. Everything is simple so far. However, what if we want to actually get some context about the functions that we are calling? So I propose that in order to do this in a kind of reusable way, we create a new function called function debug. And all this does is takes a function as an argument, prints a message that the function is about to be called, calls the function, and then prints a message that the function has been called. So the, the argument of function debug is going to be func. And then we're going to print a message about to call function. Then we're going to call the function and then we're going to print the message called function. So in order to print the called function after the function has been called, we need to make sure that we don't return the result of func directly, but rather we save it and then return it when we're done. And then if we have a function bar here that takes no arguments and it just returns hello world, we can go ahead and use function debug. So again, if we print bar, you can see that it prints hello world. However, if we print, oh, sorry, if we print function debug, debug of bar, you can see that it gives us a little bit of context, right? So there's nothing too surprising here. We pass the function bar as an argument to function debug. And then when function debug is called, it prints about to call function. It then calls func, which is hello world, but it only stores the result. And then it prints called function, and then it returns the result of bar. So we get information about when bar is being called. Of course, this isn't the most useful thing because we just use the word function. However, we can actually access a function's name, and that's stored in the functions dot underscore underscore name underscore underscore attribute. So we can actually replace both of these print messages with something a little more informative. All right, save that and run that. And now we get something just a tad more informative, but you know, so now we have some context. We know which function is being called when. So if we actually didn't print the messages of bar, you can still see that we called the function. Now, what if we actually want to pass arguments? So foo would not work for this example because if we passed it down, you could see that when we call it here, we're missing the required argument world. So of course we would need our function debug definition to take arguments to pass down to the child function. In the previous tutorial, we talked about variadic arguments and they're perfect for this use case because we don't care which arguments this function takes we just want the arguments to be passed down. 
So now if we call function debug on foo with argument Brandon, hmm, and we change this one back to bar, everything works properly. We call bar, we call foo. Maybe things would be a little more interesting if we printed foo here, and you can see that it does indeed print hello Brandon. So this is all well and good. However, this syntax is a little wonky, right? We call function debug, but we're really calling foo. Uh, but you know, it doesn't really look like a function call. It looks like we're just passing it in. So we can go ahead and actually change function debug. Instead of calling this function, what if it returned the function or it returned a function that called the underlying function with debug messages? So it's a function that takes a function, alters it, and then returns it. So let's go ahead and alter it accordingly. So of course, in function debug, we're going to have to create a new function. We're going to call it a wrapper function. And this wrapper function is going to act like the new version of whatever function we are wrapping. So this is the function that's actually going to have to take the arguments. And then this wrapper function is the one that's going to do the printing. So we're about to call function uh, func.name, we get the result, we say that we called it, we return the result, and then function debug is going to return the new wrapper function. And then function debug will only take one argument, the function to add debug statements to. So now instead of calling function debug with the function as a uh, parameter, we instead create a new function. So debug foo is function debug of foo. And then when we call debug foo, we can pass in the argument Brandon. And as you can see, when we run the program, the, the print messages are retained. And if we actually print the result of debug foo here, it works as expected. So we call function debug, we pass in foo, Right, and function debug creates a new function which calls the function that we passed in and returns the result, and then it returns this new function to us. We save the new function as debug foo, and then we call that function. Make sense so far? Great. Now, what happens if we actually take this function and call debug foo or function debug on it again? So we have debug foo. And let's now make debug foo equal to function debug of debug foo. So we're essentially calling function debug on it twice. What does this look like? Well, you can see things are a little messed up. It's kind of expected. We say about to call function, about to call function. We called the function, we called the function, and then the final result. But you might notice that the name of the function is changed to wrapper. And this makes sense because, you know, we create a new function called wrapper, we return that. So the name of debug foo is actually wrapper. But we can go ahead and change this by before we return wrapper, we can just say wrapper dot underscore underscore name underscore underscore is the same name that the original function is. And now if we run it, everything works as intended. So this syntax is nice, but it's a little bit unwieldy. Fortunately, it's supported first class in Python. So if we actually take our function debug here, we can use this at symbol and just say function debug. We put it on top of any function definition, and then it's exactly the same as what we did previously. When the Python program runs, it takes this function and it takes this decorator and it applies the decorator to the function, right? It calls the decorator with the function as the only argument to the decorator. So now if we print foo Brandon, you can see that it acts just like it did when we were calling the function decorator manually. About to call foo, called foo, hello Brandon. Very nice, and how about bar? The same thing, about to call bar, called bar. And just like we did before, we can apply this decorator many times and it will print out the debug messages many times. 
So this is the basics of function decorators. We just created a function decorator that prints simple debug messages about when a function is being called. Now, I previously mentioned this problem where we had to actually set the name of the wrapper function. This is such a problem, and it also applies to other function attributes as well. So we, if we wanted a complete wrapper, we would also have to do something like wrapper dot underscore underscore doc equals func dot underscore underscore doc. But this, this looks messy. And actually, func sorry, actually Python provides this capability inside of a library called func tools. So all we have to do is declare that this wrapper here is a wrapper of the function func. So we can use func tools dot wraps as a decorator, and we basically say that it wraps func. And all this does is it takes funks dot name dot doc, everything else we need, and then puts them as wrappers properties. So now if we call our decorators.py, you can see that it properly maintains the function names. Great. So for our second example, we're going to create a similar decorator, but this one is actually going to time the execution time of our functions. We're going to call it time it, and it will work just like our function debug. In fact, this is kind of the standard formula for function-based function decorators. So we're going to tell Python that we are creating a function that wraps func. Uh, we're going to allow this to take arguments. We're going to set a start time. So time.time .time is how you get the current system time in seconds. We're going to store the result of the function with the arguments. We're then going to print a nice message, something like calling function took this many seconds. We're going to try to put this on. So we're going to make this func.name. And this is time.time .time minus start time. Then we're going to return the result. And then, of course, we return the new wrapped function. So I think that this uh, function decorator is pretty straightforward. Uh, we create a new function to return. Before we execute the old function, we save the start time. Uh, we store the result, and then we basically print how long the function took to execute. So let's go ahead and change our foo definition here to time it. So now instead, so you can imagine the definition of foo, right? We have these two lines, but it's kind of deceiving because Python also takes time it and it transforms foo into whatever time it returns. And so time it returns this function uh, that tracks the start time and then prints how long it took. And then after that, Python applies this function debug function decorator. You'll notice that the function decorators are applied from bottom to top and not top to bottom. So let's go ahead and run our code here. And you can see that we've got everything we could possibly want. <laughs> About to call foo, calling foo took 0.0, .0 seconds, and then we called foo. So like I said before, if we actually take these decorators and swap them, you can see that the ordering is a little mixed. Uh, so we about, we're about to call foo, we called foo, and then uh, the time it decorator is called. And this time we track that the function actually took some time to execute because we printed some messages. And of course, this timing would be even more useful if we were doing IO operations or something that actually took a significant amount of time. And that is the basics of function decorators. <clears throat> we now have two functions, foo and bar. Each one has function decorators applied to it, uh, which will allow us to get more information about the function's execution. And we can reuse these decorators in all of the functions we create such that we can get some small debug messages for free. We could also make this decorator a little more uh, smart. If the program is not running in debug mode, we don't want to print these, or maybe we don't even want to execute the function if it's not running in debug mode, etc., etc. Now, the final point I want to make before the end of this video is exception handling in decorators. So. Let's say that foo had some sort of problem and it raised an exception. 
If we run this program, you can actually see that our decorators disappeared. We say about to call foo, and then an exception is raised. Maybe this is what the expected behavior is supposed to be. Maybe this is what you expect. Uh, but me personally, even if the function raises an exception, I would still like our little time it function to time how long operations took before the exception was raised. So inside of our time it decorator, maybe it's a good idea to actually put calling the function inside of a try catch block. So here we actually change the implementation such that we call the function, we return its result, and finally, finally means that we will execute the piece of code in the finally block no matter what happens inside of the try block. So before we return, we execute this. Before functions exceptions are raised, we execute this. So this is kind of a safety net that prevents uh, the code from completely bailing out on us before we want it to. And now when we call our decorators module, you can see that we have the timing of how long foo took to call before it crashed. And we can make sure that's accurate by actually doing a little bit of work. So we're just going to randomly sum up 500 integers, i plus equals one, Oh, I guess maybe. Okay, so now you can see we're actually doing a little bit of work here and we printed a result and calling foo actually took some time. So we see that foo did this much time of work before the crash happened. So this has been a small brief tutorial on function decorators in Python. There are many more advanced usages of, of function decorators. You could probably imagine maybe there's a function decorator that calls a function with a certain argument or calls a function and stores the results kind of like a caching mechanism so that subsequent function calls won't take as long. Uh, there's plenty to be had. There's also several function decorators you can use in the Python standard library, such as wraps. And as you're browsing open source projects in Python, you'll probably notice many more function decorators for you to use. Anyway, thanks for watching this tutorial. Hopefully it was informative and entertaining. And uh, please remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. See you in future tutorials. Bye-bye now.